seconds. Okay, we are online now. Hello, everybody. Um, we have a little bit um, technical issues here, and we have to. Uh, we will go by webinar normally, and later on, when the Charles uh, will finish his speech, we, he will give place for Andrew, uh, because we we can have like four people uh, on screen, and later we have to give one place for for Andrew. Sorry for this problem, but um, we can start to, yeah, we can start our webinar. Okay, so good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, because we are coming from all over the world. My name is Gosha Keut, and I am president of the Planet for De uh, Foundation. Uh, um, I am a president of Planet for Generation Foundation. Our foundation works on the subject of sustainable development, zero waste, and the basic of the Silk Road economy. As a foundation, we are advisor for companies, institutions, and the private people who want to make the changes of the world and move toward a more sustainable existence. We want to connect the people from all over the world and work together to improve the future of the planet. Climate change and its, it is consequences are imminent. Environmental pollution, greenhouse gases, and problem with plastics ocean acidification, melting glaciers, distribution of biodiversity, all these are results of the human actions. To overcome them, we need to act now with the positive and aware human action. Today, we organize a webinar of the topic of sustainable film productions and have invited the inspiring personalities, uh, which will share with you their knowledge and experience. I would like to present here Tomasz Markowski from Haka Films, Charles Gesher Duzet from Sequoia, Emily Brown, Emilio Brown from Angel Earth, and Andrew Robinson from Green Spark uh, Group, who will join us in the minute after one speech. After all speakers, we have the after all speakers have the presentation, we have 15 minutes for the questions from the audience. Uh, me and my colleagues, uh, Kaya Chupinska, will try to uh, respons will be responsible from the question zone. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the public zone uh, in the chat in the chat place in the chat window. Um, okay, so we can I can invite the first speaker speaker, and I hope you will enjoy the webinar. Okay, the first person is Tomek. Tomek, is your time now. Tomek, uh, you can turn on the microphone. And it will work right now. OK, hi, hello. Hi, hello. hello, nice to meet you. Have a nice day, have a nice evening, have a nice morning. Uh, my name is Tomek Morawski. I work as a producer and line producer for Polish and international uh, companies. Basically, we do a service production in Poland, and that's basically my job and today uh, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, our team experience in case of green, green filming and how uh, it, it did happen that we actually made it that uh, we came to the point in which we actually produced a film in which we tried to use as much green filming rules as possible. Uh, Ogosha, can you start my presentation or I, sh I should do this? Okay. Of course, I will do it for you. Okay. So it started, well, generally, uh, we will, I will try to say a little bit about the tips on green filming, but uh, where it all started, it all started with, uh, with the question at uh, just what was going around and around in my team. And we, we've been on the set on which we saw how many plastic bottles we are using. And that was the moment in which we started talking with each other about the problem, about the green filming problem, about this, that we need somehow to think how to reduce the number of plastic on the set. And the biggest thing was that it wasn't the thing of uh, getting the idea how to do this. Those ideas are really easy. Rules of, of green filming 
they, they will change each time with each project. Each project will be different. Each time you will have different situations in which you might have a chance to use green filming ideas, but there will be a number of projects in which and situation in which there will be no chance and you will have to go with the way you've been doing it till right now. But we started thinking, I don't know if you can see me right now, or you can see only the presentation. How is it? Mogosha? No, yeah. no, no. I don't know if, if now everyone is seeing the presentation or people uh, can see me. Yes. Um. Yes, yeah, so if, uh, so the thing was that we start, okay, thank you. <laughs> so the thing was we started thinking uh, in team with the next project, how to do the green filming. And it was going and going. We've been talking with each other, just sharing mails, saying, okay, let's do the meeting about green filming. And this meeting was constantly postponed. Why? Well, because the whole green filming is in our head, to be honest. That's my experience. As long as we will not change something in our head, as long as we will not go out through our comfort zone, nothing will change. We are in some kind of a track how to produce. And as long as we will not try to change this track a little bit, green filming will never happen. And that's my experience from the situation which we had. We, as a whole team with production, with the locations, uh, with the scenography, everyone wanted to change something, but we were in this track of the production. We were going, there were thousands of things that we had to do, and no one really had to had the time to actually think about something new. And then there, were, there was this moment, like everyone was in the office, and it was like kind of a click. We said, okay, let's try. Let's start talking about green filming. What can we do? And it came out that we've been sitting there in the office for the next six hours, just talking about ideas, what we can do. And it came out that those, most of those, those ideas are really easy, but as long as you will not name them, as long as you will not see them, it's really hard to implement them into the real life. One of the biggest thing that happened was that we've been sitting around the big table and we've been talking about green filming and we found out that 70% of us, each of us had a bottle and that was a plastic bottle. So uh, you see, as long as you don't name what kind of thing you would like to change, really for a long time, it does not happen. So we started thinking what to do and how to implement green filming into the production and we started with us uh, we started with uh, less printing we started with uh, communicating most of the things on emails and uh, it was a big change for us and it was uh, a big change also for the team and that was a big thing for us because we were really scared how to communicate the thing that we want to change to the team Will they go into this or they will neglect it? So there was kind of idea that maybe we will say that, okay, the like the main producer or someone else, like the big Uncle Joe, uh, told us that we have to implement those rules. But then we decided that this is a really stupid idea. We have to be ones who are behind those rules, which we are trying to implement on the set. And if we will not be able to defend them by ourselves, then this will not work. So that was one of the biggest change. And I will just tell you that the whole crew, the whole technical crew, they were absolutely super happy with the changes that we've done. And everyone was supporting us through the whole production. And that was something really amazing. We started with an email for the production meetings that if anyone wants to have a printed version of the script, they have to tell us. Usually, we, we've been printing number of scripts, so each person who was coming for the production meeting got their own script. But then it came out that out of 30, person, 30 people who came to the first meeting, actually only two people needed the printed version. It was absolutely amazing, and this was like a change in the head. So that was a big impulse for us 
to think that this might be really working, and it and it did. So one of the things we've done was uh, reduce of the printings, and the second thing we've done is uh, this will be in each of the countries it will be different. Uh, we in Poland we need to uh, have um, if we have an agreement with someone, and uh, so then this agreement has to be signed, and it cannot be. Uh, electri uh, electronic sig signature. Uh, for so at the beginning we thought, okay, each of the agreements has around thirty to forty pages, really a lot of paper. So then we decided that we will, of course, print on both sides, and two pages on one side. So four pages equals one. It was again a small saving. But it was saving of paper, it was saving of a printer, it was saving of a toner, it was saving of energy. So we've been saving everywhere. Uh, we started use, uh, using recycled materials in the office. Generally, the whole, uh, the whole thing, the whole green filming thing had to be somehow started in the production office. And then we came to a really stupid idea at the end, uh, how we figure out. Uh, I thought, okay, we're doing so good, so maybe let's get rid of uh, the uh, trash bins because we had like the mm, recycled trash bins outside of the office. But then it looked out that everyone just took their own trash and they've been keeping them on the table. So that w that was a bad idea. But you know, without trying, we really don't know what's going on. Then it came out. One of the lawyers came to us and told us, okay. There is a possibility in which you can actually have electronic signatures and you don't have to print. So that was the next step, which in which we started saving paper. Um, then we went into the set. Of course, we started with uh, waste segregation. Uh, at the end, it came out that we saved really a lot of money on uh, segregation of the waste. Uh, but that was one of the things. More, more important thing was that mm, everyone from the crew uh, got from us uh, a bottle. Yeah? So we no longer had plastic on set. We had big water bottles. Everyone could go, refuel them. And that was really a lot of, lot of savings, also of the money, but also of plastic, which wasn't existing there. We've changed um, the, the plastic uh, cutterly into metal and bamboo. Of course, today we have another problem, which is a COVID problem, but this will be a kind of regulation and local regulation. Still, it is possible to think how to do a green, uh, green filming, even in COVID, and it is possible, really. Then we found out that uh, we can actually use a catering bus which has a dishwasher on, on. so uh, we could use a re reusable plates. That was another thing which just was going and going and giving us more and more ideas how to do a green filming. But all of all, let's be honest, all of those ideas are really easy and they just need some kind of um, energy to be implemented on the set. And that was the biggest struggle during like after first two weeks of shooting that we felt that this energy is going down but then there was a big moment when we had really big scenes with number of extras and that was a uh, also a thing how to what to do with an extras they need to eat they need to drink so we made a meeting we had like about 500 extras on the set we made a meeting we told them that we have this idea of green filming and how we want to solve it with them that uh, next to the water bottles, they have cups, the paper cups, and the pen. So please write your name on the cup and use it as long as it can work for you. And again, that was the moment which just made us believe that we're doing a really good thing. All of those extras, 500 people, they started clapping. And they just told them this is the first time someone is thinking also about them and making them even more happy because they feel that they are doing something good for the movie and for the planet. Generally, as long as you are thinking about the solutions, you can try to be as green as possible. Uh, easy things like just reminding 
turn your turn the light off in in the buses in the toilets that's absolutely easy things and people do forget about it it's nothing bad in just reminding it uh it just again small savings but generally all of those savings which we get which we which we made at the end we saw that it gave us uh a good saving in the budget which we could spend on other things on post-production actually in this project uh, we also saved some money on transportation of course transportation again in COVID time which we have right now this is a big issue uh, but COVID is a new reality for every one of us so we will see how we can develop with this and after the shot we did everything what we could do to recycle the costumes and props we gave them to orphan houses to people in needs generally there was even an other institution which was coming to the set at the end of the day and they were picking up the food which was not used by us and and that was that was absolutely a great situation in in case of the of the whole shoot so all of those ideas which we had those that they are really basic they're really they're really easy to implement but the energy which we had to use was really huge at the beginning. But then when we got on the set, it started. And right now, today, I, I, I had a phone like two hours ago where my friend called me and she said, Ben, I'm on the set on which there is tons of plastic. We just made a meeting with the production and they will try to cut it off. So it shows that we started like a small movement which is going on the other sets right now which is absolutely great and uh, i really like it because we as a film production we do produce quite a lot of trash that uh, like every every other uh, every other company or every other business which is doing but we can try by those small movements to actually do green or do a little bit things for our planet and as much as you can do just try to do and so uh i just wanted to show you two pictures one of them is our seaside and the other one is our mountains because we have an access to the seaside and to the mountains and i hope that my little boy who is one year old right now will be still able to see the seaside and the mountains in the way that they are at these pictures i hope that thanks to the things that we are doing we're talking right now that we need to do this and we need to go into green filming he'll also be able to see this work which we do remember okay i think my time is off <laughs> hope that was something interesting and thank you yeah, very much thank you so much very much there is one question during the, the your speech maybe yeah. i will publish it here in the q a just quickly because it was just straight about the thing what you talked tomek what was uh what year was this case study from oh that's an easy uh we had uh, okay so we've been shooting last at the end of the last year and also we have implemented all of those rules in the uh in the sets which we have at the beginning of this year uh before the lockdown so uh we can say that they are even well they are before COVID, uh, actually but after the COVID, the only problem which we had on the set was actually uh the the transport we could not uh, actually implement on people to travel on the same bus or anything like this because of the COVID. and all of the rest things that uh you could see in my presentation it was actually implemented uh we had the last shot we've been shooting we've been shooting a movie with uh german and luxembourg uh, co-production it was one and a half month ago uh all of those rules were were there uh, besides one thing um there is a difference in each country there is a difference in the way how people are used to produce uh there is an like in the german production they really like to have a lot of paper which is printed we went totally online so that was a big change for us but at the end at the beginning <laughs> they looked at us as, as even crazy guys but at the end uh, i could see that uh many people also switched into in, into ipads and stuff like this so uh you know it's it's just again just show that you can do it and maybe you will influence someone else that was that was the thing that is the thing that we are trying to do and in case of the COVID, uh, a really good idea 
which might be one of the problems of, of course, the catering. So you have the person who is giving the catering to the crew. Uh, and we came with an idea that each person has their own spoon, knife, fork, and we just gave them to the crew. So right now, everyone has their own uh, spoon and stuff like this, and they do carry them as walkie-talkies. So that's, that, again, it became to be normal, like the drinking bottle or, uh, you know, it's just, again, the thing to show that you can and just feel that the thing that you're doing is good and also try to show to the people that it might be good. But of course, each of the production, each of the country right now has the different regulation. So we are in the new reality, which we will need to, to, to which we will need to adapt. And this will be, uh, th this is a challenge right now, for sure, absolutely. It will be even a bigger challenge with the bigger movies. And, uh, but we will see. I cannot tell you everything right now. Thank you, Tomek, very much for your speech. Uh, now we give uh, time for Charles from Sequoia. Uh, Charles, take your time, please. So can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Hello, yes. everyone. I'm sorry uh, I was... Uh, <laughs> not seeing the, the button for the song. So, um, hello everyone, I'm Charles uh, Gachet Duzel from France, from Paris specifically. So before uh, my presentation, I'm just gonna introduce myself in a few words. So uh, I've been working in the cinema industry for 10 years, about 10 years now. Uh, so I was a location manager, mainly on a big production, French and international one. I was working on uh, in the cinema, in the TV series, on uh, uh, and also on uh, advertising, and a bit of documentary. So I've seen a lot of sets for the this last decade, and um, I was quite uh, myself committed to have a, a green life. You know, I was trying to do stuff uh, like I, I could do in my private life. So at one point, uh, as Tomek said, uh, a production can produce a movie, of course, but it also can produce a lot of trash, uh, a lot of inequalities, uh, a lot of damage for the planet. So um, I was wondering, okay, if I'm uh, green in my life, how can I be green on set, um, like during my, my job and uh, during the time that I spend on the, on, uh, at my office? So uh, I started to look around and see how to implement a green solution on the set because other was working with logistics, um, with the facilities, with the location crew. I thought that it would be easier for me uh, to put green solution uh, on the movies that I was working on. But I was pretty uh, disappointed because it didn't work that well. Uh, and um, I faced a lot of challenges and it was not easy to put that in place. So, I started to wonder how can I do to um, do that in a professional way. So I started my company, which is called Sequoia, uh, two and a half years ago with my partner, Mathieu de la House. And uh, we thought, okay, if it's difficult to put it alone, because we all have a job when you're a production assistant, when you're a producer like Tomek, uh, when you're a director or an ass assistant director, uh, you don't have time uh, to put green solution. Or you can have time, but it's very difficult. Um, so I said, I'm going to create this agency, uh, which is Sequoia, and I'm going to help production to put strategy in place to be greener and to reduce the impact on the planet of the shooting. So uh, maybe can, I don't know if you want to put my presentation. Um, it's a really short one just to, to show you a, a few things. Um, so how are we working with Sequoia? Um, so yeah, a goal without a plan is just a wish. It's a, a, a sentence that I really like because it shows how we are working with Sequoia. We believe that, um, of course, you can put some green tips. You know, you can have um, green stuff that you want to do yourself uh, on a movie. But uh, we firmly believe that if you want to have a real green strategy, you need to do a proper one. So um, can you go to the next 
uh, page, please, uh, Gosha. So yeah, this is uh, just a very easy um, presentation to show you, a uh, very simple one, sorry, to show you how we're working. Um, we created, if I can say in France, because I know it exists uh, in other countries, like in the US, and Emily will talk about that, but uh, we created in France this job of the eco-manager, or as you can say, the green PA or the eco-assistant. It has several names. In France, we are the first one to do that. So we um, give the prediction a person that has been trained by Sequoia and that knows how to implement a green strategy. So first of all, uh, for me, it's one of the most important thing. It's uh, the study and the consulting. Uh, what I mean by that is every movie is different, as Tomac said, and um, you can, it's very difficult to say, okay, you're gonna be green and that, 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 and it's gonna be the same every time. Uh, we had some movies where we're shooting in the mountain, although it was like in the countryside, other movie uh, in cities, some with extras, some with not extras. So every time it's different, and every time you need uh, a strategy that is different. So you, we are doing the study, which is uh, really studying the project and see what are the specificities of uh, each uh, project. When we work on that, we can say, okay, this is a strategy that we're gonna uh, build with the production because it's uh, every time you have to work with the production, it's not like against the production. Um, so we are uh, working with them to build this uh, green uh, strategic uh, thing. So uh, we will have objective, uh, specific goals that we want to reach. Uh, it can be about the waste, management about the food about the uh, transportation about the, um, the thing you buy the thing you rent uh, and it touches everything uh, we also um, give advice for example about the, the the hotel on location if you need a green hotel or it, it can be very very the spectrum is very large so uh, we are working with them to say okay this is a different step that we need to take uh, to implement this green strategy. For me, it is really something that needs to, 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 to be in the uh, producer, uh, in the technician head, to say, okay, we will try to do our best regarding a specific strategy that we're going to implement all together to reduce the, in, uh, the environmental impact of the project. Then it is the third, if I can say, um phase which is uh, the support on set so we are um, uh, part of those people that say that uh, to be uh, to to have a green film you need someone to take care uh, of the green initiative because once you've been creating a green strategy you will need to implement it uh, on a like daily basis in a very simple way if i'm saying to you uh, you need a waste management plant Okay, it's a very beautiful words. Everyone, everyone want to have a green, uh, uh, want to have a management about waste. But how do how you're gonna do on the set? Who's gonna sort the trash? Who's gonna waste um, wait uh, all the trash to have the, the the data about that? So we believe that uh, it is important uh, to have an eco manager or an eco assistant uh, on the set that we that will do the uh, the strategy on the set. So it is uh, a new job uh, and uh, we think it's a, a good thing because uh, we, like, we are offering new jobs uh, to the French, for the moment, audiovisual, audiovisual industry, uh, saying, okay, if you want uh, to, to work with us, uh, we can train you and, and then you will have that, that, that to do on the set. So the eco support um, is uh, the... the the part of the iceberg that you will see. It is the part that you see on the set, uh, even if before that, as I said, you had the strategy to build uh, that for the set. So uh, this uh, thing is also very important to have someone on set because um, it can work also on two other things that we uh, tend to forget, is the reporting, because we need data, we need numbers, we need fact to show uh, all the stakeholders, even if it's an institution, if it's a government, if it's a partner, the suppliers, the technician, the crew, everyone needs to be aware that a production is 
um, is polluting. It's pollution has an impact when you're watching a movie, when you're producing a movie, it has an impact. So by having, by collecting data on the set, you can say, the example of the bottles is, uh, um, is, is very good because when you say on a set, you use 20,000 bottles of plastic, nobody knows that for, is that like, no, it's not that much of bottles. So yes, it is a lot. If you have uh, 1,000 movies in your country every year and you have 20,000 bottles, I will uh, uh, leave you with the mathematics. But in the end, it, the number are, are very important. It's not about going into like the carbon um, impact and stuff like that. We are doing that also, but this is more for the um, professional and very specific. But I believe the, the, the big pictures need to be heard and need to be known by everyone. So uh, in the end, people will, will say like, we don't want to be uh, on a non-green film. All the film, all the movie has to be green and it's very important. That is directly related to the communication because communication is a very important part. Uh, as I said, when you're doing a movie, when you produce a movie, you have a lot of stakeholders. Everyone is working with you. With you. You're working with specific suppliers, with specific uh, technician, with um, the, the, the area, the city you are in and everything like that. So it is important that everyone knows that's what we call, uh, you know, uh, on the presentation, you can see raising awareness, integrate, perpetuate. It is very important that everybody knows, everybody see what you're doing, what the production is doing, so they can, you know, think about that and see that it is possible and that is the new path that production has to, um, to follow. Uh, can you go to the next page, please? This is this page is to show you on a on a really concrete way uh, what we are doing. For example, uh, this is the example that uh, on a, on a um, commercial that we shot last year in Paris. So um, it was seven day commercials in a studio, classic commercial, uh, very easy. So nothing specific. So it shows you that um, we produce a lot of trash. So we were able to sort the trash and to do a really good uh, waste management. Um, so I don't know if you can see well for the numbers. Um, we only had 60, 60 um, kilos of non-recyclable uh, waste and everything else we were uh, able to sort it and to have a real company that, be, that was uh, recycling it. So we had 80% of the trash which has been recycled. And um, it was kind of hard. I think Emily can uh, testify about that, but uh, it is very hard, the waste management, if you don't have someone to do that, um, you can directly go to the greenwashing zone, you know, or uh, we've seen that a lot where some production are saying, yeah, yeah, we are doing the waste management and in the end, everything finish in the same uh, garbage at the end of the day. So it is not the, the, the idea to do that, but. Um, you can see uh, that uh, we've been able to sort even the cigarette butts, uh, more than 4,000 cigarette butts. Yeah, in the cinema industry, everybody's smoking, so it's terrible. Uh, so it was uh, nice to uh, recycle that because we have a, a supplier, a partner that um, creates furniture uh, with uh, cigarette butts. But so it was really interesting. Um, about the transportation, we were able to have uh, electric cars, so almost 40% uh, of the all the cars we had on the set were the green vehicles and uh, were not em emitting um, carbon. So we were pretty happy with that because it's not the norm so far. It's pretty hard to find uh, electric cars, electric trucks, so it is quite a challenge uh, now. About the consumption of electricity, something that we you, you maybe not thinking at the first time, uh, we help the, the studio um, to go to a green provider. So we change the provider, and uh, now the studio is working with um, uh, solar pa solar panels and stuff like that. So they have a green uh, electricity uh, provide service. Um, which is very good for the studio because we put that solution in place uh, one year ago and they're still 
on this so on this same supplier on the same provider so it was quite a good thing um and the other thing uh, we were working on was the facilities so uh, you will see uh, that we save a lot of little cups we also of course add the, the flask like that the golds uh, so the plastic bottles were avoided uh, around 5,000 uh, during the the shooting, which was a, a short shooting, but with a lot of people. Uh, 70 people uh, was quite a lot for uh, this commission. We avoided um, coffee pods, which is very important, and on the catering, uh, we served 400 we did not, the, the provider, served uh, 450 meals that were all organic, all made from local um, uh, food, like a uh, farm and stuff like that. And it was really seasonal. Uh, we couldn't go for vegetarian because it is a very hard thing to, to implement on, on shooting to go veggie, but um, we're trying to do that. Um, but also it has an impact to show that 400, more than 400 uh, meal were served when you know uh, what is the impact on the, on the global scale of the agriculture and the food, it is very important to, to work on that. So this shows uh, quite some um, solution that we could implement. Of course, uh, we were trying to do a lot of other things that we did not put on this graphic because otherwise it's impossible to read. But that, for me, the main thing that we were able to put in place and the, the, the important thing, uh, the thing that people see, you know. So, um, so yeah, that was the, this example to show you what we're doing. Um, so this is quite the end for me. I don't know. I, I'm a, how long I've been I've been talking. I have no idea. <laughs> you talk perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe, yes, okay. yes, that's fine. So, there is yeah, one, uh, there is, uh, one question for you. Maybe I will publish it. We will do like this. We'll publish one question and the end we, we will uh, ask another one. Uh, did the production choose a specific studio because it provides them with renewable energy? Uh, so no, because the studio was already chosen. It's a big studio uh, in the area of Paris and it was already chosen not for the this solution but what we did is we we worked uh during the consulting phase the pre, pre preparation phase with the studio to say okay this is a big shooting they're coming we would love uh if you could go with renewable energy and change a provider we have a partner we can put you in touch with this partner you will have we'll save money and blah 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 and then we change that now it's been a year and now the studio is uh is using that for his communication so they are now saying on the on their website yeah we are working with green energy and blah 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 so for them at the beginning they were like okay why not but now they're using that other way of communicate that they are you know, committed to you know save the planet if i can say it. so yeah it, it was good <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> yes this is uh, from our audience and um, okay, because now is the time from Andrew Robinson, but there was one question more for uh, for you, Charles. Okay. Um, uh, can you please share the link from the SICK uh, BAT <laughs> Recycle Service? I'm not sure, maybe you can find the answer for, for this question. What do you mean, the, the name of the company that is doing that? The link. Uh, the link, maybe it's link for the company. Let maybe uh, the person Adrian Prefier. Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer, yeah. could you? Yes, yes. He needs the link for for the company. If you could. No, I can, I can give it to you right now. It's a but but it's a French company, so I don't know if we, if Adrian is in France. Uh, the name is Green Minded, and it's a, a company based uh, in uh, in Marseille. In the south of France, uh, yeah. So greenminded, greenminded dot fr. Okay. Okay, he's saying thanks. Um, okay, so um, because of this pr problem issues, uh, technical issues, um, now Charles, you will go to the attenders, and Andrew will okay. take your place here. If it's fine for you, in the end, we yeah, will have no more problem. questions. And 
Okay. Um, I'm just gonna check. Uh, I'm okay. I'm gonna try. Okay, I will try to do that for you. Okay, one second. Ah. Hello, Andrew. Are you with us? Yes, yeah. I am. Hey, hello. Thank you hello. and sorry for the problem. Um, <laughs> I'm happy that you are with us. Oh my. Glad, glad we were able to find a resolution. Yes, okay. Okay, so now is your time for the presentation. I will put it on, yes? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Let me just close this one. Um, okay. Okay, and I'm able to advance them on here. Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now you, you have full, full, you can do everything now as a presenter. Okay. Okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, for participating in today's uh, event and being interested in sustainable production. Really excited to have other champions or people who are interested in making a difference. Um, so I like to kind of start the presentation a little bit with uh, what you know the whole context of like why we're here uh, we're all here because we live on this planet and and um, as was stated at the beginning of the the webinar uh, we do have a, a, a climate crisis going on right now there are lots of other um, environmental issues going uh, that are, um, are very important but one of the uh, the planetary boundary that we are exceeding by the longest stretch is uh, carbon dioxide emissions and, and uh, exacerbating the climate crisis. And so that provides a, a big context for some of the, the information that I'll be conveying today. Um, but uh, so we tend to talk a lot about uh, carbon dioxide in, in the work that, that we do, but we also approach sustainability um, more uh, broadly. I'll get to that in a moment. So the, the whole climate context is uh, is what we, we like to kind of link the sustainable production conversation to because we're living in the reality of climate change as we're saying now. It's not something, it's not a future state. It's not something that will happen uh, 10, 20, 100 years from now. We have climate change right now. We're living with the consequences. And we know that every single industry contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. And so every single industry, including film and television production, needs to transform their business practices. And so the, that transformation of business practice for our industry is really called the sustainable production process. And it's really important to acknowledge that if we have this climate crisis and we are in an industry that is contributing to the emissions, that each one of us plays uh, a role, as Tomek had really highlighted well in, in the, the case of, uh, of his production. Uh, whether you're starting in the, in the writer's room or your director or your cast crew or even extras, everyone has a role to help to, to make this transformation possible and to reduce your overall environmental impact. So what um, GreenSpark Group is a, um, a sustainability consulting firm that really uh, focuses on the uh, um, motion picture industry. Uh, we started off in Vancouver in 2014, but we've worked in many other locations as this slide indicates. Uh, in Los Angeles and Portland and across uh, other locations in Canada as well. Uh, and we've also done some work in Europe. Uh, our mission really is to help the motion picture industry to consistently integrate sustainable practices on their shows and in their operations. And while we do really think about carbon and uh, the planetary boundary and the climate crisis, we do think about sustainability really broadly. We think about it from an economic and a social perspective as well. So we really think about what is the, the well-being of the cast and crew and the well-being of the communities in which the we're, we're filming in as well. 
when we do our work. Um, sorry, lost the navigation here. Ah, thank you. So uh, GreenSpark Group is, um, we're a group of, we're, we're a small team. We're about nine people and uh, established in various pockets around uh, North America. And uh, we have basically uh, four uh, program areas uh, that we work on. And uh, one is the on production consulting, which is what we'll be focusing on most of today and what the other uh, speakers today are speaking about. But we also do a corporate sustainability strategy. So we're working with the studios in their headquarters in terms of how are they embedding sustainability and how are they supporting the production teams in terms of transitioning to more sustainable practices. We also do program management. So that's working with the film commissions to help them uh, integrate a uh, sustainable program. And we do an awful lot of uh, training and education. Um, we have some online courses that we, that we deliver and uh, either through direct interaction like this, but we also have some uh, dedicated um, education online. And I have a, um, a link to one of our courses if people are interested in having more information uh, uh, that I can give to the uh, participants after this webinar. So these are the kinds of things that we, um, we select as goals when we're working on production. This might not necessarily be the reality of, uh, of uh, all the productions in, in Poland, uh, but the principles really remain the same. So the goals, whenever you're working on a set to, um, to reduce the impact is, how can you reduce your overall carbon emissions, reduce your waste, and reduce the fuel consumption? What are the cleaner energy sources that we potentially have access to that we can use and integrate into our, our, our film production? Who is supporting us? Like we're part of a larger ecosystem where the film industry is made up of a lot of sub-industries and it's made up of a lot of, uh, of people in the supply chain that support the, the production overall. So how can we engage that supply chain to help us meet uh, sustainability objectives? How can we find some reliable green vendors that provide uh, uh, you know, environmentally certified products to us? Uh, or that can provide us electric vehicles or whatever that may be. And how do we partner with them on a consistent basis? How can we innovate and collaborate with the crews on solutions? I really loved uh, a lot of the, the uh, examples that Tomek mentioned about how they innovated and how they collaborated with the crew. And that really speaks to building that knowledge and the capacity on the set. If you, if you speak to people and you onboard them, that's really where you get to amplify the the opportunities for, for uh, reducing impacts. And as um, Charles was saying, measurement, getting the data and that analysis and contributing to reporting, that's key because you get to know whether it's a 20,000 uh, water bottles or it's uh, how much waste is diverted. Unless you name it, unless people know what you've accomplished, it's, it's difficult to get to feel motivated. And so, these are some of the productions that we've worked with, and we've found that on those productions, on average, not only are you able to avoid uh, single-use water bottles and divert uh, at least 70% of your waste from landfill and incineration, but you're also able to save money. So a lot of people talk about the cost of transitioning to, a, um, to sustainable practices, when in reality, it's actually revenue positive for a production. Uh, we've never found that a, a production has lost money from having an eco PA or an extra consultant or from adopting these practices. It's just a fallacy to think that it costs more. It's just the cost structure changes. Where you invest things will be a bit different, but overall you will accumulate savings that amplify over time so that the production is actually revenue positive. So the biggest ingredients in terms of uh, influence and collective action is really um, understanding and acknowledging the issues. It's that context piece, you know, like we're doing this 
because there are environmental issues, whether it be the climate crisis or ocean pollution uh, or plastic waste or uh, landfills or, or over full. That helps to really provide that context because doing a series of actions without context is doesn't really help to motivate people. Providing the examples with data that you have and developing common goals is also a, um, a, a key to, uh, to leveraging influence. Engaging the people, working together and celebrating the journey. These are all things that Tomek and, and Charles spoke to very well. There's a, so many actions that you can implement, but if we don't celebrate, if we don't work together and engage one another in a shared journey, then you really, it's, uh, then it's really a, uh, uh, unfocused uh, commitments. It's um, uh, it's great to have single actions, but if you can collectively do that, that's where you amplify. That's where you really shift the needle in terms of influence and potential for change. Uh, so the extra, the example that uh, Tom X said about the extras. That's fantastic. I mean, you suddenly engaged 500 people in a conversation that they wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Now that's huge potential for amplification. They're gonna go back and, and think about that and maybe integrate that in the next production that they're on, uh, or even in their practices uh, individually at home. So one of the things that I want to talk about is the sustainability on screen in terms of the amplification, because there really is a possibility for this industry outside of what's happening on production that where a difference can be made. That's normalizing sustainability. So this is an example of the uh, designated driver project, which was uh, a project that started out of Harvard in the late 80s in uh, here in well in the United States, where they wanted to, to normalize the idea of a of a designated driver and they wanted to see how could this be diffused through American society via mass communication. And what you found is that at least here in North America, the idea of going to a party and drinking and then driving has really been uh, put aside. And the, the idea of a designated driver is, oh, lost my screen there. The idea of a designated driver has really become normalized and accepted. And the same thing has happened with respect to smoking on screen, with respect to uh, uh, people of uh, various um, backgrounds and uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, lesbian, gay, transgender kind of uh, uh, characters or themes have become normalized. As a, and they've become normalized because they are reflected to some extent in the content that is developed. So we have an opportunity in this um, in our film and television production, starting from the writers of normalizing sustainability, of normalizing good behavior, of normalizing environmentally friend pract friendly practices through what is reflected on screen, not just the practices that are happening behind the screen. So that is a real pathway for influence for, um, for this industry. And there's, um, there's all kinds of ways that you can influence and normalize it. So you, you can, in the content that's being put on screen, you can question how things are being done today. Why aren't we doing things better? We can campaign for a specific environmental cause. We can inspire people. We can silence negative uh, voices and negative uh, attitudes or perceptions. And we can amplify and normalize the, uh, the good behaviors on um, uh, through our characters or through our storylines. And there's all kinds of ways. Uh, oh, I'm missing a, am I missing a, I guess not. There's all kinds of ways that um, you can, your characters on screen can be having a conversation about it, or they could not be having, they could, the, the, it could just be something that's happened. Uh, the, the story could just be in a, in a nice sustainable future. People could be buying organic uh, products they could be recycling or composting without talking about it. There's all kinds of ways that you can normalize behavior on screen. But to go back to what we're doing on production, um, what I would like to, to focus on um, is the idea of setting principles for your 
Uh, oh, I see what happened. It hid, uh, hid my slide there. So as Tomek was saying, the, the actions that you can choose are, are uh, they, can be, they can be simple. Uh, but in order to select what's the best action for the production to pursue, because each production is different, I really encourage people to think about the principles with which you're going to be approaching the project. If you have the principles in place, these can lead to solutions and best practices for you to pursue. So if you say, we're going to be making this film and we're looking at these three buckets, these three impact areas, energy, transportation, and materials, which are you know, three easy ways to kind of think about the impact areas of our production. So we think, great, okay, from an energy perspective, we want to be able to reduce the amount of energy that we are consuming. And whatever we cannot reduce, we want to decarbonize it. We want to have access to things that are not reliant on fossil fuel. So, so uh, having that principle ahead of time helps to select the actions that you're then going to pursue. The same with transportation. How do you reduce the overall amount of transportation that the production needs? And for the transportation that's remaining, how do you decarbonize it? How do you choose like electric vehicles or, or bicycles? For the materials that you're gonna be using on your production, so if you, if you set the principle of, well, first of all, we wanna reduce the overall amount of materials that we have, because if we have fewer materials then we have less stuff to manage at the outset. So as an input, we wanna reduce it. Whatever you can't reduce, try to reuse it through donation or through other productions, and whatever can't be reused, then you recycle that. Sourcing sustainably is an, is an ideal principle to, to set, and putting a goal of zero to landfill. Now that goal sounds like it might be, or that principle sounds like it might be impossible, but it's amazing what can be accomplished if you set that. So there's a, the studio here in Vancouver called Vancouver Film Studios that decided to set that goal for themselves. And so uh, you cannot find a garbage can or a garbage bin on Vancouver Film Studios lot. None of their studios, none of their stages have a garbage can. They only have composting bins and recycling bins. So if you bring garbage onto the set, it's your responsibility to take it off. And that that's, sounds really radical, but it really shifted the behavior of everyone that works there and of the productions that go to film there. And they've really been able to, to shift attitudes, behaviors, and get people excited about uh, what they're accomplishing. So next slide. Whoop, go back. So these, I, I've taken some data here um, from BAFTA. BAFTA has been able to calculate a lot of uh, uh, the, the, um, the carbon emissions of various productions as a result of the carbon calculator that they use there. But this is just to highlight the fact that each production is different. Whether you're working on an outdoor broadcast or you're working in a studio entertainment show or a, or a, a location studio-based drama uh, production, your carbon impact and your material use is gonna be very different. So if you set those principles ahead of time about reducing, decarbonizing, uh, recycling and donation, it's gonna affect the actions that you take based on the kind of production that you work on. So the actions will vary because every show is different. Um, next slide. If we think of the, the, the key impact areas the, that you want to, uh, that are key impact areas to, to reduce um, is the fuel consumption overall, your energy use, um, that uh, that you're using on uh, in your offices, the materials that you're using, the type of materials that they're using, are they sourced sustainably? Are they do they have eco labels? Can you reuse those materials? And then think of your uh, of the waste management. It's everything is a system. Whatever comes into your system needs to come out. So if you think about what's going in at the uh, at the get go, then there's a lot less to to potentially manage. Uh, on the out at the outset, 
Um, collecting your data is key, as Charles and Tomek mentioned. Knowledge is key for everyone. Collect that information during pre-production, during production, and afterwards. Report it afterwards so that you can celebrate those the, those uh, successes. You can let people know what's been accomplished. You can let people know what you're trying to accomplish in order to, to, to maintain that motivation throughout the production. And the collective a, uh, action really comes through that communication and education. And that largely comes from onboarding people, but it's collecting the data so that they have something that uh, that links back to their efforts. I've been adopting these practices, I've been doing these things, and it's leading to this outcome, which I feel good about. So educating um, cast, crew, and communities is, um, is key. And these are, uh, I don't necessarily need to go through all of these actions. We've, uh, Charles uh, went through them on his presentation very well, but these are all different things that, that you can do and it's by no means an exhaustive list of what can be done. Uh, but these are the kinds of things of what's possible on set once you've set that principle in place. Once you decide that I want to reduce, uh, it, it can manifest in terms of reducing your meat consumption, it can manifest in going paperless or in choosing battery power or accessing power from your muni municipal grid rather than bringing uh, generators that require diesel fuel or so on. There's all kinds of different actions that are possible once the principles are in place. Um, and it's up to you to, um, to, uh, to, to pursue them. They can, they, can, they can be simple and, uh, and they can be complex, but uh, what I would encourage you to do in, in order to really have uh, an influence and to start to feel like you're accomplishing something is just to start and evolve. Uh, if it seems overwhelming to put a sustainable action plan in place at the beginning, then don't necessarily try to scale the mountain. Set some initial principles in place, consider one to three key impact areas of change, and then build from there. Once you start to find solutions and you start to focus on a couple of areas and see that you're shifting the needle, then it's easier for the other stuff to come. So I, uh, if you do wanna do a comprehensive plan, fantastic. I encourage you to go all the way. But I, all I wanna say is that there's a lot of tools and resources out there. And if you feel paralyzed by them, don't wait for the tools. Talk about what you're trying to accomplish. Find and focus on a couple of key impact areas start to make those changes and build on it from there because that's when you start to see the impact and that's when you start to, to feel like we're contributing to enhancing the uh, our lives on this planet thank you for your time um i'm happy to answer questions if there are any uh, thank you andrew there's one questions going now Do we wait if if person with typing, it was great lesson to hear this. What you say? Okay, there's one question. One second, I will put it here. <laughs> to publish. Okay, there is a question for you. Can you see that? Yeah. Um. What tools would I, well, I mean, you've, you've mentioned the great one there, Planet Placement, which is uh, an initiative started in the UK and, and through partnership as well with uh, with BAFTA. So that's a great place to start for people to, to start looking at, um, at what's possible in terms of normalizing sustainable behaviors. Um, I don't know if I would, if I would point to, um, to a specific um, uh, resource that, that comes to mind other than, than the planet placement, but there's, uh, uh, I would simply say, look at at um, um, look at at any kind of content. You know, Google uh, normalizing behaviors through content. Um, there's that. Uh, um, uh, let me look at that. Uh, what was that document that I? It's called uh, Mirrors or Movers. Uh, so if you can Google that one, Mirrors or Movers, that's a, that's a report that talks about different ways that media can normalize uh, behaviors. And it doesn't, and, and it's not necessarily uh, focused on, on sustainability, but it does provide uh, sets of principles that you can apply to sustainability. So it's, it's really about thinking 
um, we can have a story like you can th you can have a story like Avatar, which was a massive success, and it's an anti-mining movie. And so, in, in many ways, it's it's you can relate that back to to sustainability, uh, or Star Trek IV, which was about saving the whales, uh, or you can simply have um, you know your television show or your film that is set in a sustainable world and it's not even a conversation that's just the setting and it's it's just become normalized and so they can have their their drama that takes place um or their comedy that just takes place in a sustainable setting and and that's already a a, a big way to normalize uh normalize uh, that setting or that sustainable future You're welcome. Oh, you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> ah, sorry. Ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that was the last questions, and the answer is thank you for for your answer of the questions. And now we will we we'll listen to uh, Emilio Brown from Angel Earth, and. It's time for, for the lady voice. I was joking, lady is opening and lady is closing the, our webinar. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Goja, so much for hosting this conversation. First and foremost, I really appreciate it. and. Uh, Thank you to all the other fantastic panelists for their insights. And yeah, I'm delighted to be here and um, share a bit more about my experience. So I'll go ahead and pull up my presentation here. Uh, so can you control which presentation comes up next? Ah, there we go. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so as Goja mentioned, uh, my company Earth Angel provides sustainability consulting services to the entertainment industry. Our tagline is uh, making movies without making a mess. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we do that. Uh, so a bit on my background, uh, I graduated from NYU's film program in 2011. Um, I was uh, very adamant about learning the craft of filmmaking because I wanted to help create socially and environmentally conscious content. Um, I recognized that our industry was a very powerful industry in terms of being able to um, shape hearts and minds and change culture. And I wanted to help learn that craft to, to do that, um, you know, to help create that change, essentially. Um, and shortly after graduating from film school, I discovered that there was sort of this disconnect between um, the way that we are, our industry can be very progressive in its content, that progressiveness did not necessarily translate in terms of our practice, um, and that there were actually a lot of wasteful aspect, aspects about creating a film. Um, and so my journey into sustainability, um, I think I was very inspired by this quote um, by Mary Hagler, who is a uh, author and a climate essayist who I really admire, um, who basically talks about how a lot of us identify as being environmentalists in some capacity, right? We sort of, um, I think Charles touched on this really well in his presentation about how we are, we are green in our lives, but we don't necessarily bring that with us to set. Um, and so the point that she's trying to make is that it is it is awesome that you recycle at home and compost at home and, uh, you know, drive a hybrid vehicle. But we also it, it doesn't stop there. Right. Our impacts in our work and our work environment also matter. And so we have to start thinking about the systemic challenges that we're facing in terms of this transition into a sustainable model. So. Uh, this was one of my first productions I worked with in New York City, um, in which we uh, shut down Park Avenue and crashed a bunch of cars. And this has sort of been, I think, the um, a lot of the mindset around our industry, um, you know, primarily in the United States, is just that we can kind of 
uh, do what we want because we are a creative industry and it's all about the creative vision. Um, and of course, while we love these types of movies and we love seeing car crashes and cool things on screen, we can't we can't ignore the fact that that is having an impact. And we can't ignore the fact that these choice, these creative choices do impact beyond just our, our world, our bubble in when we're working on a set. Um, and so here are some, some more stats for you in terms of our findings with New York production specifically. Um, Tomek, you mentioned the 20,000 plastic water bottles. Well, we're seeing on average about 64,000 plastic water bottles. Um, and then we're also seeing about 250 tons of waste, about 1,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions. And then um, this is the, the number that I really try to drive home to producers, which is that we're just wasting a lot of money on inefficient systems. Um, by that, I mean, uh, you know, paying for waste hauling for a half full dumpster, for example, um, or ordering four times as many of something uh, because we just don't know, right? We need to have something on hand um, when if we had stronger collaboration communication or with department heads earlier on, um, we wouldn't necessarily need to uh, have this amount of excess. Uh, so just some information to give you about where we stand with um, primarily New York productions. And these are the real challenges around our industry adapting because we are a unique industry. This isn't the same as, you know, trying to transition agriculture into a sustainable model. This isn't the same as transitioning retail. Like we have very unique challenges that that have to be acknowledged. And so the first one is that we're a traveling circus and we're never in the same place at the same time or we're rarely in the same place at the same time. If you work on those shows where you have that, have that luxury, bless you. Um, we rarely work on those types of shows. Um, and so we have to adapt knowing that um, every region that we work in is going to have different infrastructure around sustainability. Um, and we have to know that, you know, we have to create sort of these mobile solutions that can um, travel wherever we might be over the course of a production. Um, the other challenge is that we are an industry of freelancers. Um, so the, uh, the education never stops um, because it's not like we're coming into someone's place of work where that you have the same employees who work there day in and day out and have for years and will for years. Um, we have to essentially start from square one, more or less, uh, with every production that we work with. Um, that is shifting, I will say, like it is now, as someone who started doing this in 2011, now working with productions in 2020, I think there's, there's definitely more people are accustomed to these protocols, which is fantastic. Um, but we can't assume that, right? We have to meet people where they are. Um, the other huge challenge is that there isn't publicly available data on what our impact is. There isn't um, an annual, an industry report that's coming out that's publishing exactly what, uh, you know, our uh, CO2 emissions are and average waste generated is. Um, we know this changes radically depending on what pr production hub you're in as well. Um, but when people don't have, aren't armed with the numbers and the statistics, it's really difficult to motivate people to do anything about the problem. Um, so this is a big piece of why we put such an emphasis on um, reporting. And then lastly is this psychological bur burden that um, you know some of you probably heard me talk about before, but I think it's, it's really significant, which is this concept of cinematic immunity and the fact that creatives do often function as though they are above the rules. And we see this in health and safety, we see this in racial and gender equality issues in our industry. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that we're seeing that in terms of sustainability as well. And so we have to, um, you know, in addition to educating our crew members and, and um, all the stakeholders who are involved, we have to educate the creators, the content creators here too, um, that, you know, we don't, uh, we are not immune to climate change. I think our industry has had a huge wake up call and that like we're not immune to this virus, right? And, and that's a very real reality everyone's facing and we're not immune to climate change. And so if we don't protect the communities that we're filming in, we're not gonna be able to film, period, right? So we have to understand that these, these things are, are interconnected. 
Um, and so our, our main US standard here, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, is the Green Production Guide. Um, this is a great resource if you guys haven't uh, checked it out already, greenproductionguide.com. Um, we, we use these tools uh, primarily on the productions that we work with. So the PEACH, the Production Environmental Action Checklist, sort of a best practices breakdown uh, by department. So you can see exactly what camera department best practices are versus the electrics versus catering. Um, then of course there's the PAIR, Production Environmental Accounting Report, which is your carbon calculator tool essentially. So these are primarily um, US and Canada, both I would say use, use these standards um, for their productions. And so our solution at Earth Angel is we have these three main focuses. So we have consulting, which is focused on mainly production, but we also work with studios, facilities, um, any sort of organization really that intersects in the entertainment space. Uh, we have our good riddance material repurposing service. We'll, we'll work with productions who have just wrapped um, find homes for all of their set dressing, construction, props, as, uh, leftover wardrobe, et cetera. And then we have a huge focus on what we call our eco labs, which are our workshop and training programs as well. Um, here's a glimpse of some of the projects that we've worked on over the years, everything from big blockbusters to series uh, to pilots and, and so forth. So we are headquartered here in New York City um, and we have office in Los Angeles, but we've worked all around the country and have gone as far as uh, Uganda and, and South Africa when we worked with Disney on the Queen of Cotway. So a um, lot of variety and really, I think the, the main thing is that there really isn't a one size fits all solution here, that every one of these productions, you know, are very, very unique, require a unique approach. Um, and our model is basically based on our, what we call our four S's, the strategy, the staff, the stuff, and the stats. So if you're going to attempt to uh, green a production, you 1000% need a strategy. Um, you need to think about how you're going to educate people. You need to think about how this is going to impact crew members workflows. You need to think about where you're going to source the things that you're going to need in order to enact the strategy. Um, so that's a lot of where our team comes in. Um, the staff is you're going to need someone to implement it. Um, with Earth Angel, we have uh, an eco PA training program where we're staffing trained production assistants to do that work on set. Um, not every production, I think, requires that level of service. You know, we can also uh, just help you sort of come up with the plan. And then we often see team members, crew members kind of um, take initiative and, and, you know, create their own, integrate it into their workflows as well. Uh, and then for the stuff piece, it's all the sort of products and items you're going to need to shoot sustainably. And then, uh, you know, what happens with them when you're done? Where where are they going? How can we uh, put an emphasis on donation and repurposing? And then lastly is all the, the data collecting, analysis and, and reporting that goes into quantifying these measures so that we can continue to improve on them as well. Uh, just a couple of photos of kind of what our eco PAs would be doing in action, whether that's helping transition into a more digital workflow, helping with our food donation recovery program, setting up zero waste stations and, um, you know, moving away from the single use plastic water systems are just some a few examples. Um, and so to date, and I will actually say this is out of date, these numbers are even higher now, um, we've helped save productions. Uh, nearly 7,000 or help avoid uh, nearly 7,000 metric tons of CO2, CO2 equivalent, um, avoid uh, over 3,000 tons of waste and um, nearly, it's actually just crossed over the 2 million single use plastic water bottles and help save them over a million dollars through these, uh, you know, primarily donation efforts and, and, and waste reduction. And so here, in my opinion, as someone who's been in this space for nine years and has seen a lot of change and ebb and flow, here are the real barriers as to why we're not seeing a full scale adoption of this in a nutshell. Um, it really boils down to motivation and misconception. And, and the motivation piece is, uh, at least in the United States, we do not have regulatory compliance measures that are forcing people to do this. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a big one right out of the gate. Uh, and then on the other side, so we don't have the stick, but then we also don't have the carrot. Um, we don't have fiscal 
uh, incentives um, to get people on board and say, you know, if you meet X, Y, Z sustainability criteria, you get this um, kind of financial rebate or incentive that doesn't exist either. And then the last piece that's a very unique piece to our industry is that we don't have consumer demand um, in the same way that I think we're seeing consumers really uh, start to demand um, more sustainable fashion, more sustainable food, um, etc. We don't have audiences saying, well, I'm not going to watch this production because it, it wasn't produced sustainably, or I am going to watch this television series because it is produced sustainably. That piece is is not a driver that we are we have access to that i think a lot of other industries are using to kind of accelerate their change so we have to be creative about how we um you know uh, how we create other levers for change and then the misconception piece is really i think people think that this is too hard and too expensive um and andrew to your point earlier that you made about how this can absolutely be cost neutral it's about shifting the structure of the cost you're gonna see certain savings in some areas where whereas you might see an increase in labor in this area um and so it's really about retraining us to think about how we look at these costs because they're they're absolutely cost saving potential um, and then lastly, I'll say that even though we don't necessarily have the consumer demand, we're seeing a ton of interest in this just sort of in the high in, in the headlines in industry trades um, around people are really focusing on this more. Um, and so this to me is a really exciting kind of lever that maybe we can use in lieu of not having the, the consumer demand piece. You know, if we are really putting people on pedestals who are doing the right thing getting them that positive press and that positive PR um, and, and shining a light on those great examples, you know, I really think that can be a great motivating factor to get people involved. So um, that is definitely one thing I will say, you know, Goj, I think you're doing a great example of that right now, even just with this webinar. But if we can be highlighting folks like Tomek and what you did and on your production, um, you know, I think that's really going to go a long way and kind of putting people in the in the public spotlight here. Um, and so that's me. That's Earth Angel. This is all of our, our contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, I'm delighted to uh, answer any questions anyone has. And um, just thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Emily, for your speech. We have uh, now 10 minutes for, for the question, 10, 5 minutes. Um, we have one question here. You can just type it here. Uh, one second. Okay. Okay, um, maybe there's one. Okay, I'll read it. Um, okay, how COVID affects the green production? Can you, some of you say about Emily or Andrew, or this depends, all of you can talk also. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll start if anyone else wants yeah, to. Yeah, we can turn on, maybe we can turn on the, the mic so we, we can talk together now, have a little bit chat. Sure. Um, so I think that, uh, the main thing in terms of COVID compliance is that there have not been universally uh, agreed upon guidelines yet. So that is the big um, kind of factor that is still at play with um, how sustainability is going to shift in a you know post COVID production landscape. And I think the answer is it will absolutely shift. Um, you know there there are certain things that that are going to change. Um, I think the the opportunity, though, is how can we actually rarely in an industry's history do you get an opportunity to rewrite the rules? And so I think we're kind of in that opportunity moment right now. And I think we're that's where folks like, you know, um, Char what Charles is doing in France and, and what Andrew's doing in BC. And then, you know, what we're doing in New York is really about how can we shift those rules to prioritize sustainability, not have it fall by the wayside, not have it 
um, become a back burner thing. But we have to tackle these crises simultaneously. It's not like we get to choose one or the other. Um, <laughs> we are we are in fact partially in this COVID crisis in the first place, right? Because um, you know of the rise of zoonotic diseases a- as a result of ecological imbalance. So um, I think the the short answer to your question is that it is still too soon to say um, because these guidelines are still literally being written and agreed upon. Um, but I will say that I think that, you know, we're going to have to be more cautious and 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 conscientious 100%. And we're going to have to sustainability work very closely hand in hand with the health and safety um, uh, department and and folks as well. Um, that that's going to be inevitable. But I think that uh, there's still still a lot that is being decided in that arena right now. Tomek, um, what do you think about this? I remember our first call and you say now this time the corona came, there is a little bit different with the green production. Maybe it's also a question for you and the sec- this question from me. And also c- second question for Tomek, how, um, Tomek, do you know what is the sens- sustainable production movement in the Poland's look- Poland looks like? Yeah, okay, so I will start with the sustainable production movement. Well, it's really young. It starts right now. Uh, to be honest, uh, it's getting louder and louder. The local commissions are thinking about giving some incentives. They are uh, going to give some extra points if you are going to do a green production. Maybe in the future, you will even get more money if you will do the green production. So this movement uh, is happening right now. In the same time, uh, I know that there is a big group uh, on the Facebook. It's called uh, Green Production Poland, which uh, combines people from the industry and also from advertising industry. Uh, because uh, advertising is also the part of uh, our uh, industry and uh, they have a little bit more challenges. And actually, this is a really good thing to watch because uh, if companies which are specialized in doing advertising, ad- advertisements will find out the way to be more green, then it will be way easier to implement this into future movies production. It will be like total big change. So this is this is really important also to help those companies and to move. And also you have to remember that um, I think uh, Polish Film Commission is also giving some extra, in- oh, someone just, just put it here, that there is also a project for Polish Film Commission uh, about green, green filming. Green. Yeah, so, so generally this movement right now it's great because uh, we need to be aware of the whole thing and the second question was about the COVID well um, I would say like this that there was a word before COVID and it is today uh, so this is somehow a fresh start in which again we have to think how to, and how and what we can do in case of a green filming uh, in case of the regulations which we have, which are changing every week. And because the most important thing for the production is to actually take the best possible care of an actors, of the main talents, of your crew. And as long as you can secure this, then the second thing uh, I have to say will be, of course, green filming. Uh, but if you can combine both of those things, then it's absolutely great. The biggest challenge of green filming in COVID, of course, is transportation, uh, which, uh, well, more people will use their own cars uh, and they will travel in their own cars, not in the production cars. So that's that's one of the things. The other thing, well, I believe, and on this, what I could see lately, there won't be, this is, this is not going to be like a total change in case of thinking how we can produce how we can do a green production but there will be probably a little bit more uh, waste uh, produced on the set but i hope that we will come up with some new ideas how to approach the situation in which we are right now 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and answering this last question, the reusable bottles, well, mm, don't have an idea right now, but I think mm -hmm. there is a chance like you could actually have this kind of a machine in which you could uh, push the button by your leg and to refill your bottle. So there is a way to do it without touching it with your hand. It's just a case of trying to find the solution. But again, it is it is going to be a huge thing to be honest today. Yeah, if I could if I could add to that, uh, <clears throat> I, I completely agree with uh, with Emily and Tomek are talking about uh, how it can combine together the practices and the protocols are evolving. We don't know what they'll look like, and they'll be different under different production houses, likely. But we do know is that there is a clear link between the between this, this is a this is a health and well-being issue, and sustainability broadly is health and well-being. So, if we frame our solutions in terms of what the best things for the health and well-being of path through the planet, then we're able to frame this as as having a resilient industry that's recovering better and that integrates both uh, you know the the, the COVID protocols and sustainability. So we, we look across the. Uh, various industries, the, the companies that have really well embedded environmental, social and governance objectives into their structure are the ones that have that were, have been able to weather this COVID crisis the best, uh, you know, globally and locally. So how can we make sure that our industry is able to be resilient and recover in that way? And that's both integrating it, but it's also making sure that we keep our industry and our leaders accountable by making sure that there is a review process if and when the COVID crisis subsides, there's an opportunity to review the protocols and and uh, and continue the, the journey to uh, sustainable. Because without that, that uh, opportunity to, to review and reassess what's required, we'll just stay entrenched in our habits, which is never a good idea. Uh, Charles from Sequoia say bye because because he have to go. But if any of guests have a question to him, um, we can connect to you. You can write uh, on the foundation, and we're gonna answer all the questions. If you have any questions to Charles, and there is a question to Emily, I will publish it. And um, Emily, can you read it and answer the question, please? Yes. Okay. So when you work for a project, is there any software you use for measuring? I mean, do you measure the film's impact or do you just apply your methodology? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, our eco PAs, we have an app that we made that they can use to track the day to day waste on set. Um, very rudimentary uh, kind of tool that that lets us monitor at least the on set daily waste. So we have a sort of like more or less real time uh, solution for that. But I will say that there's obviously a larger footprint than beyond just the shooting crew. There's what the production office is making. There's what the sound stages are making, et cetera. So that we heavily rely upon the waste hauling companies that we're working with. Um, you know, we always prioritize, we tell productions to prioritize getting, you know, hiring haulers, waste hauling companies that are a lead certified hauler. They're, they're accustomed to providing waste diversion reports. Um, but the, in that case, we're not going to necessarily see that in real time. That would be something that we would see like once a production has finished or, or something like that. Um, so it is a, it is a combination of, um, you know, the, obviously the pair that I mentioned, the production environmental accounting report, that is our sort of North American standard around, um, uh, tracking a production's footprint combined with some of the tools that we've created and combined with some of the information that vendors send us. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Uh, are most changes in the industry being influenced by the top-down or bottom-up leadership at the moment? Does any of you know the answer for these questions? I think that it depends on what area you're talking about. Um, and, and the reason for that is, uh, so I think, for example, I think one would, one would traditionally think about, at least for our productions in the United States, um, around, uh, top down kind of being like the studio level down, but then I think top down can also mean like 
the producer level down to the below the line crew. Um, and so I would say, yes, the, the, the top down influence absolutely matters is, is a really, really important piece. I've worked on productions where I have not had strong producer buy-in and I've worked on productions where I do have strong producer buy-in and it is a night and day experience. Um, so I will say that that, that piece is very important. Um, but I don't, I, I think it's a sandwich effect like anything, right? Like you need the top, but you also need the bottom up because if you have, uh, you know, protocols that are really pushing for a strong sustainability initiative, but your crew members are not engaged, you're, you're also just not going to see strong results either. So that's where, you know, why my whole focus really with starting Earth Angel was like, how do we bridge that gap? How do we kind of be the connective tissue between the people writing the policies and then the ones we're asking to actually put this in practice? Um, and so it's my my take is that it's you know it's a sandwich effect. I would say that it depends on uh, on, on on the way of thinking about where we are, and um, so generally, from my experience, uh, at most of the production, the changes were coming from us. So not even from some, some somewhere from the middle. Uh, but I can see that there is, of course, for the producers, uh, that's the thing about which Emily and Andrew said that uh, in our head, changing something means it will cost more. So unless you want to try, you won't see. So there, there is no, no big need to actually try because you might fail. So as long as we had the chance and we actually made this effort uh, with one of the producers and, and showed uh, to Agnieszka, the producer, that it will also bring some savings, at the end, I can see that uh, the whole information is spreading. So to be honest, I can feel that this is coming from everywhere, uh, to be honest, but rather from, from, from uh, top down. Or bottom up. No, no. To be honest, both ways are uh, are doing the same thing, and they're pushing into the green. Of course. Yeah, yeah I, I'd agree with that. It's coming from various places, and uh, and the essentially it's anecdotal. It'll right. There'll be some. There's some examples where it's coming top down. There's some examples where it comes bottom up. There's some examples where it's where it's in the middle. Uh, it's just not systemic yet in any kind of place, and and. But there is an opportunity, given the competitive nature of this industry, and given the creative forces, and once people start to actually speak about it more, once there starts to become more uh, uh, public accountability, or or some of the productions or the studios decide to start talking about what they've uh, accomplished, then you're going to have a, 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 I think a, a domino effect due to the competitive nature of this industry. No one's going to want to. Uh, look like they're the laggards on this. Uh, we have one question here more. I've got uh, I've got uh, one more question, either Emily or Andrew. Are you fiscal, fiscal intensive in US or Canada or green shooting? There are and uh, there's uh, started to be, but it's really nascent. It's very, very early. Uh, I can speak about what's going on in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, so in Vancouver, they the, the municipalities have said like, if you're able to film, if you're filming on location, and at least uh, on some of the days, some, you're not using diesel generators. You're either plugging into the municipal grid or you're using battery power. They'll give you a 50% off your permit. Uh, so that's that's an incentive so far, but it's it's really not robust. It's, uh, there's an ongoing conversation right now about uh, incentives for uh, for um, productions to adopt uh, renewable diesel for them for uh, and to get tax incentives for, for that, but uh, it hasn't manifested in anything concrete yet. But we're getting it. What do you think about incentives? I mean, I'm personally against green incentives. In my opinion, then it brings the whole thing to business side, not to think about what we really can do. And uh, I mean, I have a big problem with green incentives, to be honest, because uh, as long as you can do it, you do it not for 
the money or you, you shouldn't do it for the money you should do it for the bigger purpose that, that's that's my thinking philosophically i'd agree with that but to, to emily's point we're a traveling circus and if you have one city that's offering incentives and it's cheaper for you to make your your production in in city a versus city b people will travel to city a and at least that's the nature of things in north america uh, okay so um so on, we're you know uh, philosophically i would love for people to do this but i think that uh, understanding how this the the industry operates i think incentives will be beneficial yeah that's I, the reality i i agree and i also think that it's about getting uh encouraging the adoption of the change too right like people often need something to take that leap to say i'm gonna move away from generators and you know into this new way of work like that's for some people is like a real psychological shift like how am i going to possibly do something differently than a, the way I've been doing it for decades. So by making it the cost piece of it more appealing, I think that we can bring people to the table to make those shifts that much quicker. Um, and then just really quickly, New York City does not have a fiscal incentive program. Um, New York City has an initiative called uh, NYC Film Green, which is a, a designation program um, that productions that meet certain sustainability criteria can get a seal um, that they can put in their end credits as, you know, they were a sustainable production that shot in New York City, but it, there are no specific fiscal incentives tied to that designation. Okay, thank you. That that was a really good answer also in case of my thinking how to change from one point to the other. Uh, at this level of incentives, I do can agree with them. I mean, as long as they are pushing, as as long as this is not part of the business, but this is like pushing into the green, then then it's all right with me. Uh, and it's going to be the last question, and it's going to be from from me. Uh, how um, green production looks in the school film? Do the in Europe or Canada? Do you do you have these topics in the school films? Because I know in Poland we don't have it yet. Probably maybe next year it's because something going to change. Uh, we're going to talk more in schools about this, but how it works in, in your in your countries? Well, it's not, Again, I, I, Andrew, can, Andrew? I can start if you want. Yes, yes, please. Um, well, I, I think, again, it's not necessarily systemic, it's more anecdotal. So. Uh, so in Vancouver, we've been having a, a, a conversation with over a number of years with the local there's, there's five uh, educational institutions that have a film program in Vancouver, and and we have been teaching courses in four of the five of them, and and they are interested in formally embedding that course uh, for all their cohorts in, in the future, and so we're looking to engage uh, other uh, higher education film schools in other jurisdictions. Uh, in order to be able to do that as well. But the only place we've formalized so far is in, in Vancouver and a couple of anecdotes uh, uh, in Los Angeles and Toronto. I, I think it's a great question. I think that we have to be educating the next generation of filmmakers that there is not an option to shoot not sustainably, right? Like we want this next generation of filmmakers to come out of film school thinking this is the only way, like there isn't a, another option. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, for, for us, I mean, obviously NYU is my alma mater. And so I frequent, I frequently do presentations there for some of my uh, former professors and, and their classes. We do, a lot of recruiting from NYU for our Eco PA training program, so that that's been really successful. And we also um, they started a green grant program with the Office of Sustainability and um, and Tisch School of the Arts combined. So they uh, a specific um, group of uh, seniors, um, film students, got a grant to make their thesis film sustainable and they like produce this little video about it too and so there's um there's definitely stuff happening at at the film school level i would say um but i would love to see you know a more kind of uh streamlined even like curriculum for it uh that, that you know this is this is the approach and and everyone kind of graduates from film school knowing X, Y, and Z about, you know, sustainable production practices, certainly. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, do you would like to comment something or add something? Because we, we, we should finish in the minute, so uh, 10 to, to 7, so I think it's time for finish now. I can just add one more thing. There was a question about how, uh, what should we do in, in the time of COVID, how to save the single use of articles okay. in case of catering. Yeah. Well, mm, it's again, it's going to be the question about the local ro rules that you have. But generally, I can imagine think like this. You will probably have one person who will be serving a food from a catering bus or a food bus to the crew. So there is this one person who will give the food. So as long as none of the crew has the contact with him and he is just giving or putting the, the plate with the food on the table, then you don't have to use a single use articles it can be ceramics, it can be anything, and then they can be washed again. But this is only an idea how we could do this. And I think today it has to be somehow, it has to meet the crew. You have to talk with crew about the possibilities that you have, because the some people might be scared and they don't, don't want to go the way you, you want to show this to them or you want to serve the food. So this will be a process in which we have to figure out how to show our crews how we want to work with them and how do we secure them from getting sick from the disease that really no one knows and probably everyone is more scared than they should be at the end. But I hope that we will find it really fast because I cannot really imagine and I hate the look of the one-time used single-use masks on the street and uh, and all the stuff which cost which are caused by COVID. And this is one of those things that, again, we can think about, that when we have the opening of the production, maybe uh, we should give everyone from the crew the, the mask which is reusable, which can be used more than once. And this might be also a great gadget with the name of the movie on it and stuff like this. So those are small things which about which we can think about to just cut the number of the trash that we do produce because this is part of the production that we do and this is a specific part of our circus because we use them every day and if you have the people in the office they don't use the masks and we are uh, obliged to use the mask on the set so yeah any ideas which you will have just let them know us and and let's try to implement them into life and engage your service providers where where you're you're required to use these personal protective equipment. Because yeah. certainly in North America, there are service providers who will gather the for the personal protective equipment and they will recycle them. Uh, so it doesn't need to be uh, uh, incinerated or landfilled. There are service providers who will recycle PPE. So I would encourage you to research that in, in whatever jurisdiction you have. Thank you very much. We spent almost two hours together and it goes like five minutes. It was really impressing and all the knowledge that we get. Hopefully everybody gets um, get inspired and we'll, uh, we'll make the changes from tomorrow <laughs> because we have to act now. We don't have time for wait. We have to s switch like this and just make the changes. And, and the most important thing to go together and you know work together help each other is the most important thing to do thank you thank you emily andrew tomek and charles who have to leave us uh, if you have any questions um audience if you have any questions you can write down to us or you get uh, you get the email addresses of our uh, presenters hopefully you can connect to them and work together thank you very much Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for having nice us. Day yeah. and nice evening. Nice evening, nice morning, nice middle nice of the day. <laughs> Bye. Good luck on your journeys. Thanks for having us. Thank yeah. you very much. Two so more fun. green. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.